Okay. Uh, our speaker tonight is Dr. Eugene Genga, who has already joined the meeting. Dr. Genga is a rheumatologist and is the one who is going to guide us through the discussion on uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Welcome, Dr. Eugene. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kilozo, for the kind introduction. Uh, can you give me one second? I just upload uh, uh, the presentation. And just as a, a clarification, are my slides visible? Yes. And, okay, thank you. So um, I'd like to thank uh, Kenya Orthopedic uh, Association for inviting me to discuss on a very uh, interesting topic called rheumatoid arthritis. And let's thank the sponsors also uh, for giving us a platform to, to discuss about rheumatoid arthritis. And I'm hoping that at the end of this particular discussion, I uh, would have come up with what is new uh, in terms of uh, in terms of pathogenesis uh, symptoms, but also I think I take a message that rheumatoid arthritis is more than the joint. I think in the next few years it will still be called rheumatoid arthritis, but rheumatoid disease. So just what is rheumatoid arthritis? I'm sure you know all this. It's just basically an autoimmune disease uh, that primarily attacks the small joints, uh, hands, toes, the wrist. Uh, that causes a lot of pain and swelling amongst our patients. Uh, one thing about rheumatoid is by not by it's symmetrical, sorry, so on both sides of, of the of your body, there is the asymmetrical. So in terms of uh, Kenya, how are we doing? Um, the very first case of, of rheumatoid arthritis was documented by uh, a, a gentleman called Harris in the 60s. Uh, that time was a big deal. Actually, when I went to do my, my fellowship, a lot of the guests you know, believe that we actually have rheumatology disease here in Kenya. And over time, the numbers have grown. This is a, a small case study done, done by Bug uh, in the 70s. Uh, currently, Kenyatta is about 200 people uh, on follow -up, regular follow-up for the for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, currently, we have a, a public, uh, in terms of public hospitals that have clinics, uh, Kisumu has something there. We have a colleague there called Dr. Charles Omundi. Uh, if you go to Eldoret, there's a colleague there, Dr. Beryl Ganda, runs a clinic. Mombasa, there's a doorway around the SAC clinic. Uh, the rest are basically based in Nairobi. So how are we doing? We're not doing too well. Uh, this is an audit we have done uh, a couple of years back in terms of we're trying to see uh, how soon our patients are being referred to, to get some sort of service. And uh, we're comparing with the NICE guidelines. The NICE guidelines are the guidelines uh, documented by the UK. As you can see, majority of our patients are coming after one year, and that is uh, not uh, uh, not uh, not good. Uh, ideally, ideally, we want them to see within three days of presentation. So, what does this lead to? Uh, a lot of our patients are doing that well. We are slowly we're improving. We even have guidelines now from Atruma, but still we are not doing well. Uh, partly because of the late diagnosis. Uh, two also in terms of access to medicine. Uh, in terms of the demas from the microtrexia, the lecnonamides, when the biology will discuss later. But also in terms of, of, of control, how do you assess? We don't really follow up uh, strictly. Part of the topic today will be discussing about how to actually document or how to uh, assess how a patient is improving or not improving. So in terms of, uh, this is a very interesting article done by, in the pharma, I think in the pharmacology department, look at pain management amongst patients with rheumatoid arthritis. And as you can see, uh, majority of demands, but pain was still a problem. Uh, one very important thing was poor adherence, and partly was due to cost and severity of the disease, uh, but largely large due to cost. Cost is a major issue. So these are some of the things, especially when you're setting a treatment plan for your patients, it's always good to classify and see what can they afford, what can they afford, and then from there come up with a treatment plan. And one thing, something very important that at least half of the patients on the day of the interview find some sort of pain. And their pain actually hampered their job, ability to work, and enjoyment of life. In terms of this, just a spectrum of what we have in Kenya, this was done by my colleague uh, Agatha a couple of years back. Something very important, as you can see, is the herbal medicine. A lot of our patients use a lot of this herbal medicine. We really have to fish and dig because the problem with herbal medicine is they interfere with our, our treatment. We don't know what is there. Some of them actually are anti, are actually pro inflammatory, sorry. 
rather than anti-inflammatory and may actually interact with some of the medicines, but also take, for example, drugs like leflonamide, methotrexate, have, an, have a risk of uh, hepatotoxicity, and some of the medicines, the, especially the herbal stuff, you know what is there, there's a potential risk of actually damaging your liver and damaging your kidney. In terms of disease control, as you can see on the chart on the right, um, blue, the small blue are those in remission, very few numbers, mild disease, also very few numbers, majority actually, 60, 30 percent are actually in moderate severe disease. So you can see we have a long way to go. So what is the prognosis? Uh, this is just some Western data. Uh, 40 percent are disabled by 10 years. So I think we really need to get these guys early, aggressively manage them better, so as to avoid these sort of numbers. So locally, there's an audit we are done, uh, looking at work productivity amongst patients, the rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, as as most studies, rheumatoid arthritis is more common in women because most of the most of the participants are actually ladies. And it was very interesting that one in two had to miss work uh, due to rheumatoid arthritis, uh, with a mean rate of about thirty percent. Uh, average loss of working hours per week was nineteen hours. That is very alarming. Something we need to we need to do better. Uh, another forty nine percent, basically half, had some sort of work impairment due to the disease. Others had present easy, meaning that they are there but not working at the optimum about 62%. And overall, in terms of daily activity, half at least were saying that rheumatoid arthritis actually affected, uh, affected the daily activity. So in terms of uh, risk factors, this is normally a question I'm normally asked by the patients. We can't really pinpoint onto one. Uh, yes, there may be a role of genes. The genetic component puts you at risk, but we believe it's a multifactorial uh, in terms of the pathophysiology a combination of environment, lifestyle, and largely some players that we're still trying to figure out in terms of what causes motor arthritis. And why is this important is because um, pathophysiology is not what you see at the top. It's like an iceberg, but what you see at the bottom. As you can see on the iceberg, the top may look small, but actually in there, there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of joint damage. And these are things which we really need to be aware of because sometimes when we're seeing the patient, see the patient, the clinic say, ah, this is not that bad. But you don't know about the ongoing inflammation that's going on with the patient. So as a snapshot, I'm sure there's some residents here. This is a slide they would like to see. Um, is that look at what, what are the, the, the key mediators in terms of the pathophysiology of, of rheumatoid arthritis? There's a role of the B cell. B cell produces now the, the, uh, produces the antibodies. They actually have medicine that targets the B cell, which is like rituximab. Uh, some of the pro-inflammatory markers that, that also propagate rheumatoid arthritis, the TNF alpha, interleukin 6, we actually have medicines that target those. These are we call the biologics. We'll mention something small towards the end of the presentation. So as you can see, whatever line of pathophysiology, our, our good friends abroad are actually trying to see if they can apply that in clinical practice and actually we're getting very good response from our patients. So in terms of diagnosis, there have been very many, very many diagnostic criteria. The latest that we're using right now uh, is this one. And as you can see, uh, anything above six, basically you have the diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. And six is even minus the, the, the serology. As you can see, if you have joint involvement, you have a high CRP and duration, you don't really need to the serology. The serology just basically prognosticates the patient. I'll discuss that later. Is it a low titer? Is it a high titer? Is it a single positive? Is it a double positive? Because the prognosis is good for us because right now we're trying to see is there you can actually predict response to form of patients. Because, for example, if a patient was come with a double positive and a single positive, double positive meaning double uh, moderate factor, anti-CCP, there's a just one moderate factor or one anti-CCP, so we treat them the same way. That's something which uh, which people are trying to see if they can come up with a way we can come find out to prognosticate our patients. So I, I like cases uh, they keep per week. So we have a 30 year old lady comes with a three month history of progressive pain and stiffness uh, involving several joints, notably is the wrist, the hand, the feet, the ankle. When you examine her, you find that she has mild tenderness in the MCP joints, the wrists, and you're concerned she may have rheumatoid arthritis. As you can see from this particular presentation, there's some things that stand out. Number one, duration is more than six weeks, that's three months. Number two, look at the number of joints involved. It's symmetrical, meaning both sides. Largely small joints, the wrists, the hands, the feet, isn't it? I feel that joints like the ankle, but largely more of the small joints. So this is what we call a typical uh, history for rheumatoid arthritis. So in terms of how to confirm the diagnosis, we have the diagnostic criteria. Uh, the other thing will be, what would you use to, in terms of uh, 
treatment, would you want to start something small, prefer later, or if you're comfortable enough, you can start the patient with some sort of uh, medicine that particular time. So for our patient, as you can see, symmetry is there. Number of joints above, we have the MCP, the MTP, PAP, as you can see, this is right there. Morning stiffness. So um, there's a thing that professor used to have that any patient comes with joint pain, as the clinician is supposed to tell, is it inflammatory or non-inflammatory? So inflammatory joint pain is pain that um, that is worse <clears throat> with, uh, I guess, worse in the morning. As the day progresses, it actually disappears. vis a -vis non inflammatory is pain that is worse with the activity. For example, they'll tell you that at the end of the day, when I've worked a lot, my knee swells, my knee is painful. That looks more towards more degenerative like osteoarthritis. vis a -vis, a younger tells you it takes me maybe 30 minutes to get from bed. Then I go to shower. There's a bit of pain, a bit of stiffness, a bit of fatigue. So it tends to say this more of the inflammatory type of pain. And things that can help you there, once you've got the pain, is the inflammatory markers, ESR, CRP. Normally, ESR, CRP, unless a lot of painkillers, most likely it's an inflammatory. If the ESR, CRP is high, most likely it's inflammatory. Remember that also there are some big symptoms of inflammation that are there. There's the fatigue. Uh, sometimes weight loss is there. Uh, apart from the pain, they might have muscle aches, sometimes hair loss, sometimes they have sicker symptoms involving the eye. They tell me like, my eye is dry. So dry the point they tell you that they have like sand in the eye that keeps scratching. Remember that rheumatoid arthritis is not just the bone. It can affect the eye, it can actually affect the lung. We even have data locally where we will document the numbers for those particular uh, areas that are involved. So key for our patient, symmetry. Number of joints, location of the joint. That is very important when you're trying to establish a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis. So when you look at the joints, uh, this, this chart is very important, uh, not only for the classification or diagnosis, but also for monitoring purposes. As you can see, we have the elbow, we have the shoulder, look at the hand, look at the feet. So why this is important for us is because patient A will come and will examine and say has 20 swollen joints, 10 painful joints. They come a month later, they have 10 swollen joints, five, uh, five um, painful joints. So you can see there's a trend that the patient's gotten better. Vis-a-vis, -vis, somebody comes with 10, 10, and then later on it goes to 10, you can probably tell the patient's getting uh, worse. But usually the trend is that we don't expect a, a remarkable improvement. It should be something gradual over, over time. As you can see here, the number of joints, so they're available on the internet. This one's and you don't have to come anything. This is like you can actually download them from the internet and get them. <coughs> So in terms of biomarkers, I think the most important thing is ESR, CRP. I know we usually rush for rheumatoid factor and the CCP, but I think if you take a good history, you think it's inflammatory, the test will probably tell you it's inflammatory. Then you can do the rheumatoid factor and the anti-CCP. Uh -huh. So that should tell you, uh, for the ESR, CRP, we use it one for diagnosis, but also sometimes you use it in terms of trying to prognosticate the patient. The higher the value, the more likely that this patient has a, a more aggressive uh, disease or high disease activity. So rheumatoid factor, um, just as I noticed that not every rheumatoid factor that is positive means the patient has rheumatoid arthritis. Generally, they say that the general population, five to about 20%, the normal population will have a positive rheumatoid factor and, then, and actually don't even have the disease. So it's something which you should be aware of. So you should always try the, the, the tests, the symptoms, I remember that it can occur and also it can also be other pseudos, for example, or mimics like other autoimmune diseases like lupus can give you false positives. Even things like hepatitis C can even a false positive. So for us, why we are, what I was talking about earlier that we are trying to see is there a way we can predict response. So the higher the value, the more aggressive the disease. So I'll be more aggressive how I do what I approach this particular patient. And we have data out there. A lot of research has been done and they've shown that actually the higher the value, the more aggressive the disease, and you should actually treat this patient uh, more aggressively. And CCP is a bit more accurate uh, than rheumatoid factor. And something very important that it may actually precede the clinical symptom. So, but the, the take-home message is that we should not treat every anti-CCP unless the patient actually fits the criteria for rheumatoid uh, arthritis. So as you can see from this particular chart, uh, patients who had rheumatoid factor actually up to 10 years, I mean the anti-CCP, sorry, the chance of getting rheumatoid arthritis is actually very high. Something very important to you know that, that a lot of patients who, especially smokers, smokers tend to get a lot of these anti-CCPs and usually they tend to get the more aggressive form of treatment. So I think we'll jump this. Imaging as something has come to really help us a lot. 
Uh, why? Partly because of diagnosis, uh, but two, prognosticating our patients. So we usually have certain features that should be able to, especially see the particular osteoporosis uh, around the MCP, PIP. You, some, why this helps us? Because certain patients tend to have the zero negative form of the rheumatoid. So sometimes when you're not sure, the, the symptoms are there. RF negative, CP is negative, high SR, CRP. But then what could be next? You're allowed to do an X-ray. And the exercise test may actually face the, the diagnosis. Uh, right now, there isn't a role for MRI where money is available. Not a rush for MRI, especially in Kenya. But the push right now is more towards ultrasound, and you can actually pick up certain features for RA and ultrasound. So as you can see, the the, the, the one I'll show you one on the, the extreme right, an erosion. So an erosion on an X-ray is not a good sign. It probably means that patient has had that disease for a long time, or is a more aggressive form of the disease. So you need to take uh, care about that. So uh, in terms of diagnosis, so remember that there are a couple of differentials. Lupus is high on the list because most of our patients are actually female. Uh, it presents the polyarthragia, there's some stiffness, there's a fatigue. So lupus is something you should look out for. So arthritis right is another differential. Though not so common in this part of the world, we tend to see it more in the HIV world, but it's still there. But the difference between psoriatic arthritis and the other arthritis is that psoriatic arthritis is more asymmetrical rather than symmetrical. And actually, the site also is very important. Apart from the asymmetry, it's more in the distal major joint vis a vis array that's more in the MCP and the PIP. Reactive arthritis mm -hmm. is something to, we see a few, not that common, but this tends to happen post an infection, maybe up to three months. Gout is just a differential. Uh, and gout, gout, gout is a very interesting disease. We should discuss about it because I think we tend to really misdiagnose this and tend to mismanage it also. Uh, we have the polymagia rheumatica, but that's missing the, the elderly people. So um, where, where is all this important? Because right now, the approach is that is the window of opportunity. That if these patients are caught early and treated aggressively from the beginning, potentially, you can actually get some good rates. Uh, there's some papers that have been published in, from uh, Holland, and Holland, some from Spain, whereby they've actually been able to to actually stop the disease at month seven, month eight of treatment. But remember that what they do there may be a bit different from here in terms of how they pick up the patients early and even they follow up in terms of how they follow up the patient from treating to target. So uh, another case, uh, these are the things that we usually get. 32-year-old Paratu comes the five month history of joint pain, fever, malaise, make the diagnosis of RA. She's planning to get pregnant. So we really have to be congruent that Sometimes the pregnancy plans, uh, like my boss, my, my, my former professor in England will tell me that at the end of the day, if, if, you, if you don't give the patient service, you have to make alterations so that you can make them happy. And actually things like a toxicologist, a lactopyrin, I know sometimes you the gynecologists are very safe in pregnancy. So the lady does well, the whole of my hypertension, disappears after delivery, comes back later. Now she's breastfeeding. What do you do? She has a flare up. Give a steroid shot, that sorts out, put on HCQ, salazofirin, again, she gets most to on. So she comes back two years later. Now she's 34. Mm, the, the pain's worsening, fever worsening, malaise worsening, there's more stiffness. Her quality of life is affected because simple tasks like tying shoelaces, button clothes, now is an issue. Uh, and at the time of the evaluator, she has uh, multiple tender joints and multiple swollen joints. So, um, we suspect she has RA, isn't it? So we do the necessary everything and you measure everything. And so right now, what people are trying to move towards now is something called treat to target. So what is treat to target? So like, for example, for hypertension, we usually use blood pressure as a, as a gauge to see if the patient is improving. Diabetes, we have the random sugars, HbA1c. So what do you use for? for rheumatoid arthritis. So we actually have some disease scores that can actually help us in terms of uh, treating a patient target. So the disease scores, how they work is that they usually categorize into four scores. We have remission, we have low disease activity, high disease activity, mean moderate disease activity, and high disease activity. So you always want that every three months, the, the trend is downwards. So maybe from high, then to moderate, then to low, and then eventually what? Uh, remission. And that usually is the target that we want to achieve for our patient. And, and why is this? Because like I said, the, the current shift is that we need to get these guys early. And a lot of the damage happens in the first two years of the disease. And it could explain why by, by 10 years, most people are disabled, especially once the studies from the same margin, what happens locally. 
to really pick up these guys early, treat them aggressively as early as possible. What are some what how the, the disease cause work? We have C die, S die, does you have certain you can Google, but basically what they do is they look at the number of joints involved. They have the part for a patient assessment, how much the arthritis has affected them. The doctor gives the assessment, it's put in a calculator, and the score just comes automatically from there. So you'll probably be wondering, there are so many scores, which would be the best. So one of my good friends, Dirango, is a physician now in uh, Nyeri. He did a very interesting study where he was trying to see which of these calculators would be the best, especially in Kenya. Some of them use labs. For example, like the, the c die uses a lab. The s die also uses a lab. So things like this, um, so that's 28, that's 28, and the s die actually use lab parameters, CRP, ESR. c die doesn't use a lab. So we tend to see, especially for an African setup whereby you don't have access to some of these labs, if you compared uh, disease activity in a patient using DAS, is a VC day to the S day, what would be the effect? And actually, found that they're all the same. So I think we, that excuse that there's no lab to assess, I think goes out the window. And I think we should push. For me, I use a lot of C day, a lot, a lot, a lot of C day. Though the most, if you look at most of the studies done on R is more of DAS 28, but DAS 28 requires more of the CRP. So, um, like we said, we're treating to target. So for example, like that's 28, any score above five is high, above uh, between three and five is moderate, two to six is low, less than two is remission. So you always want to get them early and treat. So as you can see from the chart down there, uh, the chart with some green, blue, gray, as you can see, it is from active disease all the way to remission. So usually what they say is every three months, that's how you engage to see if the patient is improving, or not, and that is how we treat to target. So when you X-ray our patient, uh, the, the lady who had defaulted, you find she has erosions in the hand. So you can see clearly she has a, a bad, poor prognosis. When you do the DAS score, the anything above five is high, has is seven. So that's already a bad marker also. And the CCP, very high. The motor factor, very high. So now we are left the choice now, what next? So there's options of methotrexate or nephronomalism. So what determines each is usually more tolerability, but they all work the same in terms of uh, efficacy and everything. So either can be used as fast lane, so then because they all reduce disease activities, slow joint destruction, reduce uh, radiographic progression, and ultimately modify the course of the disease. Uh, methotrexate is more commonly, is more, actually most studies have used methotrexate has been the anchor, but leflonamide actually offers an alternative uh, because sometimes methotrexate has issues with tolerability. Um, most patients have issues with nausea, vomiting, and all that. So sometimes they're able to tolerate methotrexate well. So leflonamide gives them an option. Uh, sometimes in very uh, poor prognosis patients, we are allowed to actually combine leflonamide and methotrexate, but we really have to watch out for the pathotoxicity. So um, there's a very interesting study where they are trying to to compare between tapering um, two methotrexate combination and metronamide to see how it should be the best. But they're trying to see that um, between, interesting enough, if <laughs> we tapered uh, using more the leflonamide side, actually perform better than the methotrexate. So I know methotrexate is a bit easier to taper than the leflonamide. So just a, as, a, as an, a quick summary of what are the drugs that are available, we have methotrexate, we have leflonamide, salospirin, and oxychloroquine. I think the thing to note here is that Pregnancy, lactation, what is safe? Uh, where do you need to adjust in terms of kidney function, age, like the elderly, pediatrics, really nothing much, really. So it's just a, a snapshot of what we need to do. So, um, very interesting study that I came across to that many years ago, where one of our colleagues, Kirui, he told us in Eldoret now, and uh, at Eldoret, this is Eldoret, at Eldoret or Kericho, and he found that a lot of our patients have cardiovascular risk issues. From hypertension, diabetes, dyslipidemia, smoking. So we really need to be local for this because a lot of the time for our patients, in the beginning, control is the issue. A long term, because of the fatigue, the steroids they have taken, they can wait. So pressure becomes the issue, diabetes becomes the issue, dyslipidemia becomes the issue, smoking and obesity. So that becomes an issue. So um, where they put up this slide is because nephronamide sometimes can raise the pressure. So any patient who is on nephronamide you really have to look at all the, on the blood pressure aspect. 
So in terms of predicting response, um, from, from what, what has been found out there, if you're a female, poor prognosis. Late uh, disease test. Uh -huh. High disease activity or diagnosis, poor prognosis. Previous use of a DMAD, any DMAD, poor prognosis. High inflammatory markers, poor prognosis. Level of seropositivity, is it single, double, or the title saying, extra articular features, poor prognosis. Uh, I see this is a genotype, we don't do that much in Kenya. But for a patient, had a couple of things that are against her. She was female, she had high disease activity, and she came, that's for 7.8. She had previous been on some DMATs, high inflammatory markers, double positive or whatever. So you can see for her, we need to be very aggressive in how we approach her. And like I said, a lot of the destruction happens in the first two years of, 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 of the disease activity. Like I said, up to 90, 93% have a lot of joint destruction. So uh, in terms of how the guidelines work, um, the different ways how you look at it. ACR tend to be a bit more conservative. ACR and the American College of Rheumatology, they say start low build up. EULA, on the other hand, and BSR, BSR are the British Society, EULA, the European, are a bit more aggressive in how they do it. I prefer the BSR because from there you're able to really prognosticate and start early. Uh, EULA, they give some certain factors where you can be able to start aggressive from the beginning. So it's up to you to see which is best. Uh, me, I prefer the DSR and the EULA guidelines. So for our patient, what we did, we gave a, a combination of, of two demands, that's HCQ and the NSA. So she comes back after 10 months. Mm -hmm. Kind of improved, not improved-ish, but her scores initially said they're going down, now they're going up. You've tried as pushing up the methotrexate, added left hand, non added HCQ, nothing. So the next thing will be what next for a patient. So at this juncture, we must entertain the possibility of treatment failure. And, and this way we say treat to target. So our target is that within three months, there must be a 50% clinical improvement and hopefully try and achieve remission within six months. Though in clinical practice, especially in Kenya, because our guests come a bit late, Six months is not that common, though we see it a bit. Some of our patients come early, but most guests will come after going all over the place and everything. So by the time they see you, may not be able to achieve the six months. But able to at least achieve fifty percent every three months, you should be okay. So um, at the same time, also um, when you look at this uh, treatment failure, that there's some things that can help you to see the treatment failure. For example, if you repeat the X-ray and find some erosions, the antibody titers are still high. That really tells you that possibly that things are, are going wrong for, for a patient. So important to know that two out of three patients will fail to respond. I mean, one out of three patients will fail to respond to, to the regular demands. So you might actually consider actually switching or adding something for that. So you always make sure that you know that what I tell the patient is that yes, we're starting on this treatment, but usually 60% will do well. It's a 30 something percent that you may need to either adjust add something on top of what you're taking. So this brings us to what are the updates in terms of rheumatology. Old school, we had the methotrexates, the clonamides, aspirin, and all that. New school, now the biologics. The biologics are very good drugs, but the thing should be that it should not be said that all patients with biologics, you must fit a certain criteria. Biologics are very expensive, and still the normal DMARs can still work if used appropriately. So some of them, some in the market have etanercept, etanercept is a TNF inhibitor, tumor necrosis factor, infliximab is also available, uh, rituximab is a B cell uh, depleter, is also available, adalilumab can be available, though it's a bit expensive here and there and not there. Uh, there's a drug called golilumab also that's available. So what some of the drugs companies are trying to do is to do some programs whereby you buy two, get one, three, try and cheapen. Like those, we still need a lot in terms of lobbying. Because, for example, like rituximab costs almost what per dosing is almost 300,000. If you had cancer, the government will give you for free. So, I think we also need to lobby to get some of these things in the formulary for the government. So, um, what exactly are these biologics? Uh, and the pathophysiology actually applies here. As you can see, B cell play a role. Rituximab works there. 
Uh, if you have the inflammatory markers that is in part of the TNF part, of it, we have drugs that target that. The Eclipsumab, the Tynesep, the Tagulilumab is there. IL-6 is a drug called Actemra, Otosilizumab, which was used for COVID uh, a few years back. It's actually some medicine that the COVID people borrowed it. It's also available in Kenya and actually works very well for our patients. So anytime the patient uh, doesn't do well, options are what? Either increase the dose or go combination. If money is available, push for the TNF inhibitor. Okay. So um so um think we can skip this one. So for, for our biologics, what 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 do you normally use in terms of screening tests? Uh because biologics take for example, like I'll take the one like tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is usually for uh, for you to protect you from that tuberculosis, you must uh, have the TNA pathway active. So imagine you have a biologic that actually targets the TNA pathway. So you really have to screen our patients prior to getting the medicine. So we did a blood count, kidney, screen for TB, hepatitis B, hepatitis C. So that's for TB, we may actually do a chest x ray even a TB quantiferon. Uh, for for tosilizumab, tosilizumab has an issue with cholesterol and everything. You have to screen the baseline for for what was little of the liquid profile? We have to immunoglobulins. We don't do this much in Kenya, largely because of cost uh, consideration, but it's something to consider. So for TB, if you are not sure what I just said, it's a very busy slide. <laughs> if you're not sure, just consult the consult the the, the, the chest guys, the chest team. Um, usually the two things that things that can happen: the patient can be free of TB, start the medicine comfortably. Two, the patient can have latent TB. So what they usually do is there's some medicines give concurrently with the, the biologic so as to prevent reactivation to disease. Or three, you have active TB. If you have active TB, what the guidelines recommend is that you should at least get uh, treatment for at least two months. On the third month, you can actually start on the, the biologic. So HIV, I know people usually wonder what, but HIV there's no really big issue as long as the CD4 count is about 200, viral load is adequately suppressed, it's safe. Mm -hmm. So I think I'll skip also that one. So side effects of, of, of the biologics uh, infections is there. Malignancy, a little hard, but now we are, we are a bit more confident. Sometimes can have neurological issues, autoimmune antibody, as in like issues. Patient with heart failure, it must be very cautious. It must be handle the drugs cautiously for such patients. Ah, yeah. So as, as one of the things like I said at the end of this presentation is that we need to appreciate that rheumatoid is not just a bone. Or joints. So I have a case, actually this is a true case, one of my patients, 67 year old, actually she's a lady, came with zero positive RA, she said previously for TB, has come with a cough. When you see her high disease activities, X-ray, high titles of CCP RA, chest X-ray, ILD, post TB fibrosis. Options, would you go metrotrexate, would you go nephronamide? So in terms of lung, it's a, one of the most common manifestations of motor, uh, lung disease. Uh, there's a study we're done in Kenyatta that is looking at more pulmonary function. Noted that about 40%, uh, but basically 38.5% of our patients had some sort of lung abnormality. Uh, some of the symptoms reported were dry cough, dyspnea. Uh -huh. So there's some of the things you should be aware of. So uh, one thing we should be aware of is that patients who tend to have on methotrexate, there's a, there's a slightly increase of developing some pneumonitis. So you really, when you start the patient on the medicine, usually the pneumonitis presents within month zero and six months. So they'll start coughing, the dyspnea, the fever. On the blood count, you notice the hemophilia. Usually there's a hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So you really have to stop that uh, medicine. Usually when you stop the medicine, the patient usually uh, does well. So patients of ILD, like I said, then they will more telomere medicine. I prefer either, either a biologic or the phenomenon might work well for such a patient. So what, what put patients at risk for pneumonitis or methotrexate? And if there's this lung disease like our patient, above the age of 60 like our patient, male, how our patient was female, uh, diabetes mellitus, high disease activity scores, chronic kidney disease, prevalence of DMADS, uh, genetics also play a role there. Sorry. So um, in terms of uh, I, rheumatoid ILD, what are some of the risk factors for interstitial lung disease? Usually it's a male and a former smoker. 
from experience. Those two usually, that combination usually, uh, a lot of them tend to have a lot of ILD in that, uh, that particular subgroup and tend to also have also elderly uh, disease activity. But sometimes you'd be surprised you find, again, in the 70s, you wonder where are you? You look back in the history, they tell you, oh, I used to smoke at the Kijana, the age of 20 and 30, then I quit. And that may actually be the trigger for the rheumatoid arthritis later on in life. So uh, for our patient, like I said, options. We can't give it to check it. To our patient, we get several nephronomides and the combination. She didn't do too well, because you can see her markers were high and everything. Eventually, we were forced to go to uh, biologic. Uh, they took some and she did well. So another thing is the eye. We tend to really ignore the eye. Uh, one in four have actually high complications. This is a study done by uh, one of our students. There's a lady from Sudan who had, uh, she's called Ajapol. She did a very nice study. I wish she published it that looked at eye complications in rheumatoid arthritis. And actually one in four actually had eye complications. And very interesting now that some of them didn't even know that was an issue. They thought it's just, it's okay, it's okay. And some of the complaints they found the dry was 92%, cataract with 2%, inflammation and hysteritis. Why is this important is because uh, I've seen one, two patients come later and actually blind from the disease. And it's because either they're pumped too many steroids or they're getting the wrong demands, just painkillers. So I think the earlier we, we appreciate the fact that rheumatoid is not just the joint, it's more than the joint, we should be able to have a holistic approach. So usually what I tell my patients is that when they have eye symptoms or not, at least once a year, they should see the eye doctor. Because some of the complications that are there uh, from the eye can only be managed by biologics. There's adalilumab and there's infliximab. Uh, and this is not common here, but the face map is actually available. Okay, yeah, we have a few patients who actually been able to actually save their eyes. The only issue is cost, 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 cost. But in terms of efficacy, it actually works well. So, I'm uh, sure people be asking, what is the experience of some of these biologics in Kenya? Uh, There's a very nice study done by by Kofoyo a few years back. We looked at Tuxima, uh, and they had about 36, about 40, 40, 41 patients there. And actually, it was able to demonstrate that a lot of the patients significantly improved on, on this. Uh, interesting enough, we didn't mention any case of TB, which is very interesting because sometimes when you go outside there and you tell the, uh, our colleagues outside, I say, we used to do some beer, the first thing they wonder about TB is so common in Kenya. I sure didn't have TB and all that. But for this particular study, it was, an, it was actually published at the African Journal of Rheumatology. So uh, there's another audit which I've done um, in terms of looking at. Uh, just at a private clinic uh, here in Nairobi. So we had 41 patients who had uh, some sort of rheumatic disease. Majority had rheumatoid arthritis, some had kylosing, one had about some had antisynthetes, SLE chagrins. Majority of the patients were on, on TNF inhibitors. There was golinumab, simplexumab, uh, a few on rituximab, uh, actemra, and acanesent. So what is very interesting is that uh, we tried to look at why were the patients on on those particular biologics, we found that a number were unable to achieve any low disease activity. Very interesting enough, some were actually trying to conceive. <laughs> it's very interesting. I, I remember like when, when I, was, I was, was studying in the UK, we had something similar. A lady was trying to conceive, she was on salatopirin, HCQ, nothing. And as long as you're in pain, you can't conceive. So we pumped our steroids, we the point where our problems are put eventually. So let's try the biologics. And within a few months, it settled, she was able to conceive. So with that, I was able to try. Some of them we did uh, retrospectively, and actually they were able to conceive. Uh, others came on the breastfeeding, and the disease activity was so high, we were able to control the normal uh, demands, and can't give it to the or the flora in that particular area. And actually they were able to carry on less in the breastfeeding period. Once they transitioned the breastfeeding period, we could now step up and give them uh, other demands. Uh, in terms of complications, um, so the other indications that a few had intestinal lung disease, one actually had uveitis. In terms of complications, we had one particular patient who had TB. Uh, this patient has glaucoma, uh, intestinal lung disease, and she was a bit, we really tried to educate her, but she was a bit too <laughs> of axillas and she should be all over the place and everything. She picked up TB. She even had COVID twice <laughs> during the COVID period. A few patients had COVID also. Something very interesting that we noticed that we had uh, a few patients who had uh, photosensitive dermatitis, the case one, the columbus and the rest. We had that uh, one patient who had a DVT, though we can't really verify just one patient, but something which we we'll observe as we move along. So I think at the end of the day, early diagnosis. 
earlier diagnosis leads to better outcomes. And I think right now the push should be more towards uh, prognosticating our patients, number one. Number two, choosing the appropriate treatment. And remember that appropriate treatment depends on a number of factors from age, what are their preferences for pregnancy and all that, are there any complications that are there? Uh, but also in terms of poor prognosis, how the titers are there, erosions and all that. Number three, once start on the treatment, is treat to target. And not just come and say, Mama, how are you doing? You're okay, I have continued. You should be able to count the joints that are affected. Tell them, look, last time there were 20, now we are 10, we are doing well. Okay, because we usually have the, 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 the issue of just giving steroids, go home, steroids, go home. Steroids help with inflammation, but do not, do not stop the disease from progressing. And ultimately, we're able to have the treat to target, should we have better outcomes. Uh, we, there's actually an, uh, a guideline that was done by the Atma Society of Kenya. Uh, if you go to, for those who would like uh, the guidelines, maybe they can maybe reach out to me by a mail, I'll be able to share with them the, the, in the, the actual guidelines. And uh, at the end of the day, remember, treat to target. Treat to target. That's the thing they take home message. Every three months, half the disease activity. Half the disease activity. And at, at the end of the day, when you don't consult, a number of my orthopedic colleagues usually call me up. They do not see the patients. <laughs> they do not see the issue. They call me up for all sorts of things, gout, rheumatoid. But at the end of the day, they don't want our patients to be better. And I know sometimes with these illnesses, patients may not be comfortable seeing a new doctor. So we, we're here to help for those who are there. The really complicated cases may be fancy. But the really mild ones, we can work as a team to help the patient out. Uh, we're done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Genga, for that very good presentation on a topic that has uh, really mutated in terms of uh, treatment. Uh, any questions on the chat? Doc, I hope you can see the questions on the chat. I can see uh, Mbithi has greeted us, so hi Mbithi. Uh, CPD, I think this is accredited. Uh, Don't worry about those ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's in house. <laughs> I know it is October, so we'll be sorting them out. I do. <laughs> Even better than CPD points. Uh, uh, Any questions on the chat? There's a question by Philemon. He's saying, what are the standard practices in resource-limited settings in terms of diagnosis and treatment? Should we be dependable on number factor only which most of the time is either reactive or reactive in some centers and it's secure in treatment. Okay. So thanks, thanks, Lemon, for the question. Um, um, resource limited, I think Kenya is a resource limited area. Maybe unless you are in the hospital like I can, <laughs> but we are all a resource limited setting. So I think ultimately um, it goes down to history taking, isn't it? And examination, examining of patients. So um, if you look at the, how we diagnose rheumatoid arthritis, we must have a certain amount of joint count. Look at the duration, isn't it? Before we get to rheumatoid factor or the anti-CCP. If able to demonstrate multiple uh, joints involved, symmetrical, more than six weeks duration, in the usual presentation of everything, the rheumatoid factor is just a booster to it. And the rheumatoid factor is, is done so differently in Kenya. Some do what, 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 what. But it helps in terms of that it should be tied to the, the symptoms. So I think if you're able to do that, it should be fine. In terms of treatment, um, at the end of the day, cost is always going to be an issue there. I wouldn't dash for the biologics for this. I think at the end of the day, the biologics are yes, they are fancy and everything, but the normal DAS can work. And if you're able to, even if you go to the internet, use the, the, the scoring system, the DAS. And you're able to demonstrate that the, the disease activity has gone from by 50% from this month, this month, and all that, you should be okay. It's just a systematic thing. The only challenge you have is that I'm sure, like, I don't know about, 
if I extrapolate the orthopedic clinic in Kenyatta, I'm sure your clinic must be full of so many people. So that, that might be a bit of a challenge in terms of carefully monitoring some of these patients. So in terms of uh, HCQ, HCQ is a very good drug uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, but it's not something we use as mono alone. Uh, unless maybe it's a, it's a mild disease where a patient is maybe pregnant or breastfeeding and everything, we tend to prefer either uh, methotrexate or nephronamide as the baseline, and HCQ is an add-on to that. Um, I'm seeing somebody saying, can orthopedic surgeons manage RA medically? Um, if if we get our guys early, like you've seen from the data, and prevent the complications, I think there'll be no need for surgery at that particular time. But it has to be cheat to target, cheat to target, cheat to target. So at what point do we intervene surgically? This is a very interesting question. Sometimes they get harder than the patients. I remember like there's a lady who had deformities of the hands and she wanted to get uh, a hand operation. And I was telling her, hey, that one will be very difficult for any person to touch. Uh, so she forced me, so I had to contact I have some friends in India, some guys in the UK and South Africa, and they all said the same thing, that's not touch those things. But I think in terms of where to intervene, usually having rheumatoid arthritis can put you at risk for things like osteoarthritis. Uh, sometimes you get nodules and everything. Maybe that's when they pull the work. And what are the markers do we aim for before surgery? So it's a very interesting question. So I think pre-op, I should have made a presentation that day. Okay, sorry, I didn't, uh, didn't think of that. So pre-op, I think is what how to prepare patient for, for surgery. I think at the, at the end of the day, we'd like our patients to have low disease activity because if the disease activity is low, the outcome or chance of success are very high. That's number one. Number two, a lot of our patients, rheumatoid arthritis actually rarely affects the spine apart from the leg. So the, the anesthesiologist should be aware that the patient has rheumatoid arthritis because we don't want to go and start intubating and poke the wrong place and the patient actually. I've, I've seen a few patients actually go like that. So you really have to be aware about that. Uh, number three are the medicines. Uh, most of the medicines, some you have to actually stop before a surgery, things like the methotrexate, uh, like the tuximab, you have to take like, like the tuximab step, I think like three months before you actually do the operation. The methotrexate may actually be a week. So yeah, you really have to look into all that. But I think that it's just working hand in hand with the, uh, with the, with the rheumatology team uh, and the guidelines are available on the internet. Then people find. The last thing are the steroids. Steroids interfere with healing. So you wouldn't want to operate on somebody with high doses of steroids at that particular time. So you'd want at least less dose or no steroids with them you're, you're operating. Because of not only healing process, but also in terms of infection control post the operation. Uh, guideline, yes, there's a guideline. Uh, maybe what I'll do, I'll share with the, with the organizers for the meeting, uh, guys of Torrance, and then they'll be able to disseminate. Actually, there's a guideline. For, it, was, it was done by the Asuma Society of Kenya. Uh, another thing, physio. I think physio is something which we really tend to underuse in Kenya. Uh, a lot of people don't really understand what the role of physio, but physio is more for rehabilitation. Uh, because uh, one of the major issues with rheumatoid arthritis is that it puts you at risk for osteoarthritis. It puts you at risk for wasting of the muscles, stiffness and everything. So a lot of our patients, if, if there's no proper rehab, they'll probably develop the secondary osteoarthritis from that. If there's no proper rehab, they're very frail. They'll fall down, they'll fracture the surgery again. There are other things that can be avoided. And you want our patients as mobile as possible. The last thing is that, yes, we are trying to restore function also. So it's not only physiotherapy, but also for occupational uh, therapy. So um, thanks for that. There's a question here. What's the average monthly cost for a fair case? Um, so um, the, the costs have actually come down in terms of uh, how much uh, uh, the drugs cost. I know in terms of, and I'm, I'm prof, prof, I have more experience than many of my usually says that the amount that we pay for methotrexate and the nephronamide in Kenya is, is ridiculous. Because if you go outside Kenya, the costs are very, very high. I think with the, with the influx from our, our colleagues from India, and the nearings have really helped drive the cost down. Uh, in terms of the biologics, that are too expensive. That and only when, when, usually for me, I tell my patients that I'm sending a biologic. I must be sure that this is the yeah. best option and the only option of success is actually there. Another question, does R affect the costal cartilages and therefore, yes, it can. Yes, it can. Uh, it can actually affect the lipid as on its own, but also, but most of the time, it affects like, the lung architecture from the inflammation. Thank you.
think I've answered most of the questions. Yes, I think I have. Maybe Dr. Kilonzo. I think the Q and A. Unless somebody has something burning. Hello, is the is the sponsor around to say something? Yes, we are available. Okay, we give you a few minutes to say a few words. Are you ready? Sponsors, are you ready? Yes, yes, I'm sharing my screen so that I can proceed. Okay. Dr. Close, so you can see my screen. Uh, I can't see your screen. I'm only seeing the chat. Let me see. Yes, I can see Torrent somewhere. Yes, that is, that is us. So this is Torrent Pharma. My name is Daniel Bikundo. I'm the country manager at Torrent Pharmaceuticals, Kenya. So as you can see from the screen, we are ready for tomorrow when it comes to therapeutic areas. We our products are distributed by Medox. I will give just a word on who is Torrent. So Torrent Pharma, we cover a wide uh, global area, including the U US, Brazil, Germany, Philippines, and the rest of the world. We are present in more than 40 countries plus. Torrent Pharma, we have a cutting edge research center on your Right, you can see the research center with very modern manufacturing facilities and the strong, our presence in the domestic market is very strong. And we have a very wide global footprint in including Africa and Kenya. We manufacture branded generics, normally because of regulatory uh, situations of country to country, India business, Brazil, Philippines, and countries like Kenya and some African countries, they require branded generics. But in countries like USA, German, UK, and others, they require generic market, uh, generics, uh, generic, generic names. Why I'm showing you this is because I would like you to understand and believe that the same product that goes to the United States, German, UK, because those, that is our biggest market, is the same product that we bring to Kenya. So quality is assured across the world. We have been around for more than four decades. We are present in 40 countries. We are ranked number seven in the country with most pharmaceutical companies in India, that is, we are number seven. And of course, we have a future looking forward to continue providing uh, uh, um, quality products. One of such quality products that we have is in the management of rheumatoid arthritis, which was the topic for today. The product, uh, of course, you have understood from uh, Dr. Eugene that rheumatoid arthritis is an autoimmune disease. So it's all about the immunity. And you can see how it does damage to the joints. We have this wonderful product, which has been time tested the first generic of lefulamide in the Kenyan market and in the world at large. I say it is time tested because uh, from the time DMATS started being used, lefulamide came to the market. The innovator did not stay much, especially in Kenya. So the first generic for so many years has been lefra. So many patients have been put on lefra, nothing adverse has been reported about LEFRA, its efficacy and safety has been outstanding. So it is obviously, as we have been told by Daktari, that this is uh, in a class of DMATS, disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drug. 
you find most of the time lemon uh, arthritis is a painful disease uh, and the patients are put on uh, painkillers, um, all those things to relieve pain, but you need to reverse the disease progression. So demands come in handy to reverse the disease progression because the danger of the disease progressing is that the patients will end up even to an extent of using wheelchairs and having caregivers, and that will be economically not viable, very costly. So Lefra comes in only to reverse rheumatoid arthritis from progressing further. Of course, I, know, I would not like to emphasize a lot on the mode of action, but Lefra simply stopped, stops DHOD from converting virimidines to T and the P lymphocytes. Of course, you understand these are the cells that destroy the synovial membrane, resulting in inflammation and swelling. So Lefra comes in to stop DHOD. That is the brief mode of action. Of course, that way you reduce the proliferation of the T and P cell. I don't want to, to talk about indications of uh, Lefra. We all know it's in rheumatoid arthritis and uh, uh, lupus erythromatosus. The, the dose, uh, it depends on case to case. I've seen some doctors prefer using 100 milligrams as a loading dose for the first three days to achieve that if, um, effective window. Or you can just put the patient on 20 milligrams continuously. But when on 20 milligrams to achieve the, the effect, it has to be like two weeks. But still, uh, it's OK. It's just a warning that uh, lefronomide cannot be used in pregnancy and is potentially highly tetrogenic to the developing fetus. In that case, the patient, if, you want, if the patient needs to conceive, we have to wash lefronomide or lefra out of the body using um, uh, activated charcoal uh, so that we avoid this incidence. Akari has really elaborated on the comparison between uh, the, the monotherapy of lefronomide, methotrexate, I don't want to waste your time and go into those details because Dr. has really very well elaborated. So we, are, we say that Lefra is safe and effective as initial treatment of active rheumatoid arthritis with clinical benefit. This is very important, sustained over two years of treatment without evidence of new increased toxicity. When it comes to juvenile idiopathic arthritis, lefronomide has been very useful, and this has been published in the Journal of Rheumatology in the 2010. So lefra is very effective in juvenile uh, idiopathic arthritis. Still, a with the, when combined with methotrexate, well discussed by Dr. Eugene. And uh, all this Dr. Eugene happened to mention, I don't want to go there. Then I would like to mention what are the other products that we can use, especially in arthritis. Arthritis may it be osteoarthritis, arthritis, may it be rheumatoid arthritis, will always be accompanied most of the time with neuropathies. So we have this brand, wonderful brand of Brigabarin called Togabarin. So it comes in 75 milligrams and the conditions like fibromyalgia, spinal cord injury, this drug can reduce neuropathic pain. And we have, I don't want to talk about that. And now during the treatment of some of these conditions, uh, things like NSAIDs, they cause erosion of the uh, gastrointestinal membrane and the, the, the presence of acid worsens the situation. So it's advisable, I know doctors know more than I do, to include some acid suppressing agent like PPIs. We have one outstanding PPI by the name NextPro, which is 40 milligram tablet. We also have, it is IV, NextPro IV. This is a very wonderful product, especially that we have used a very unique 
specific technology to develop the tablets. So doctors, you could try this on patients who require PPI, will be probably on NSAIDs. We also have another PPI called Pantor, that is Pantoprazol. Of course, we know uh, one of the outstanding features of Pantoprazol is it is used in combination with many drugs because it is drug to drug interactions is minimal. Thank you so much. And I thank you all doctors for attending this webinar. And we look forward in collaborating and participating in more of such webinars. We are ready to support any coming webinar. And thank you very much for the evening. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Torrent and team for that presentation. And uh, thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to host you. We have got very many webinars which are coming up. Thank you very much to the Genga, Genga for that presentation on a subject that is quite new. It sounds very new for those of us who left medical school some time ago. And thank you everyone for finding time to be with us. Uh, next week, we shall have a slightly different kind of a CME for the orthopedic, uh, Kenya Orthopedic Association members. We shall be discussing the issue of the Institute. We are going to send out the invitation. Uh, so don't miss out on this. It's good that you get the update. Mine is to wish everyone a good night and thank you for attending.